one of our family members that has COVID. So we're not going anywhere. Um, no, only one out of the seven of us has um, symptoms. So it's my oldest son, Clay. So y'all be in prayer for him. That would be wonderful. Um, I'd ask that you pray the Lord's hand of protection on us um, so that we can continue in his ministry and continue doing the things that we need to do. Um, but I want you to also know that if COVID is part of our immediate future, then we will cross that bridge as it comes. But in the meantime, tonight, we're going to continue Wednesday night studies. Uh, we're looking at, at unique stories in the scripture, scriptures that are kind of, um, how do you say, uh, strange. And then maybe glean some things out of those strange stories that help us to grow in our faith and grow in our understanding. I want to make sure that I'm online and that people can see it. Yep, there I am. Good. Make sure that that is public and we're good to go. So let's start with a word of prayer this evening. And we're going to be in the book of uh, Judges. We're going to be in, in Judges chapter 13, 14 and 15 and into 16. But we will cover those just hitting the hot spots. We're going to look at Samson tonight. So let's pray. Father God, tonight in Jesus' most powerful name. We thank you for all that you blessed us with. And Father, we we, um, we thank you for, for grace and for mercy. Lord, I pray that you'll watch over our country. I do. I am burdened for our country. Um, the way that we as Americans are acting, Father, it's we've left our moorings and we are adrift. And so I just pray right now that you would send revival into the land. And Father, may it begin with me. I pray that you would touch... Um, I, would, I pray that you would touch and reveal what's in the darkness. And Father, I pray you would open the eyes of those that are blind and the ears of those that can't hear what's actually going on. Father, awaken us to the spiritual warfare uh, that we are caught in. And Father, I pray that you would wake up the eyes of Christians um, that have gotten blinded as well. And Father, I pray that you'll help us to be a light unto this nation, help us to be salt, and help us to praise you with all that we do. And Father, tonight I, I do, I lift my son to you. Um, I pray that you'll just touch him, that you would raise him up from this very hour, um, and that, Father, you would just um, keep him safe. And, Father, with that in mind, I do know of so many that have been touched by COVID and are being touched by COVID. I lift up my friends that I read about on Facebook that are fighting it right now, friends of mine I went to Bible college with. Lord, I pray that you will touch uh, their bodies, raise them up. Father, those that are struggling with job losses, Father, those that are struggling with the falling economy, and Lord, just all the things that are going on that take our mind and, and burden us. And Father, may we always remember that we receive from your hand those things that we need or we burned. And so, Father, I pray you will help us to open up and that take ownership of the things that we've done and help us to correct our path and that we would call upon you and that we would turn from our wicked ways and we could see you heal our land. And so, Father, tonight as we look at uh, Samson, um, one of your judges listed in Hebrews, as a, a man of faith, and so I know some people may question that, but we're going to look at some of the things about Samson tonight, and uh, I guess if we were going to title this, we'd title it, um, What Does Long Hair Have to Do With Anything? So Father, in Jesus' name, bless our study. Amen. So we are going to look at that tonight. We're going to look at what does long hair have to do with anything? Uh, did Samson get his strength from his hair? Um, and I would say no. Uh, Samson didn't get his strength from his hair. But let's walk into this study just a little bit, and then we'll see how the Lord guides us tonight. So in, in, in Judges chapter 13, we have a change of judges. Now, in the book of Judges, there are many, uh, many judges that are there in the land um, that we see on and on and on. And one of the recurring themes in the book of Judges, and the people did what was right in their own eyes. And we know that's always a problem. It's always going to cause conflict when people do what is right in their own eyes. So they had deduced that what they're doing, how they feel, and those kind of things are right. We're living in a world that is very similar to that world. People do what is right in their own eyes. Um, they do what they feel to do. They operate on feelings rather than on truth and guidance from the Holy Spirit. So I, I pray that this study of tonight will help us as Americans, help us as individuals, and mainly help us to be better disciples. <clears throat> help us to walk after Christ as we should walk. So let's take a look at this. So we have in, in Judges 13, verse 1, it says, Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. And so at the beginning of the book, at the beginning of this chapter, we see that they're, they're under the rule of the Philistines. Now, 
the Philistines are a sea people that landed on the coast over by Gaza and all that, where that's at today, coast of the Mediterranean, and they kind of grew and they shrank during the, the rains. I mean, the Philistines are something that we see going on in the time of David. So the, by the time we get to even the second king, the Philistines are still kind of an issue um, in the land. So we go through the judges, and then we go through the first couple kings, and, and we see the Philistines are an issue. And the Philistines were not God-fearers. They were not of the land of Canaan, nor were they of the Israelites. And so they were a sea people that came in. And lots of things have been discovered about them in the last 50 or so years with archaeology, but we won't get into that because it's not, um, it doesn't pertain to our story. So it says there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, so of the tribe of Dan, whose name was Manoah, and his wife, Mrs. Manoah, because we're not told, was barren and had borne no children. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and give birth to a son. Now, therefore, be careful not to drink wine, nor strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. For behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb and shall begin to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So, so there's a couple things that we can get from this announcement of Samson. First of all, he's going to be a Nazarite. He's going to be a Nazarite from his birth, not a Nazarene. A Nazarene comes from uh, the town of Nazareth, Jesus, uh, Jesus of Nazarene. Uh, of Nazareth. Uh, he was a Nazarene, not a Nazarite. And there's a lot of confusion, it seems, in a lot of people about that. But a, a Nazarite was somebody who had taken a vow, normally a personal vow, to be consecrated. That's what the word means, to be consecrated to the Lord, set aside for the purposes of service to the Lord. So so this angel of the Lord appears to Miss Manoah and says, hey, you're going to give birth to a son. So no drinking, no unclean eating, because you're going to give, you're, you're going to give birth to a son who's going to be a Nazarite, and no razor shall touch his head. Now that, that's basically all we have about what's going to go on with him. But if we'll, if we'll go back to, to Numbers chapter 6, we get kind of a definition and explanation of a Nazarite. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak unto the sons of Israel and say to them, When a man or a woman, I love that part, makes a special vow, a vow of a Nazarite, to dedicate himself to the Lord, he shall abstain from wine and strong drink, he shall drink no vinegar, whether made from wine or strong drink, nor shall he drink any grape juice or eat fresh or dried grapes. All the days of his separation, he shall not eat anything that is produced by the grapevine, from the seeds even to the skin. All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall pass over his head. He shall be holy until the days are fulfilled, which he separated himself to the Lord he shall let the locks of his hair on his head grow long. And then it goes on and talks about not touching, um, not touching the body of a dead human, um, which was interpreted also as not touching anything dead. So I'm not sure about the dietary requirements other than uh, no grapes were allowed. Now there's a lot of um, philosophy about why the, the grape was completely off limits to somebody who takes the Nazarite vow. Now jumping ahead, let's look at Paul. Uh, remember, Paul took the Nazarite vow, and, he w and, 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 and we know that some of the people with him did because he went to the temple at one point, and he paid what was required of, of the closing of the Nazarite vow, and he went into the temple mount. That's when they accused him of bringing a Gentile in, and everybody just went nuts on Paul. He was arrested and all those things. So we know there was something still going on in the first century. Actually, um, I've watched several um, Hasidic Jews of late on YouTube and things, and and there are still that do the Nazarite vow. Of course, they can't do a Nazarite vow um, like it was given with going to the temple and paying and, and taking and shaving their hair and putting it on the offering below the fire, below the offering above the fire. And there was a lot of rules to closing out the Nazarite vow. As a matter of fact, if you made, and, and, and what I understand is typically a 30 or 60 or 90 day vow um, that, they, the, that people vow. So it's not typically a Nazarite vow from birth. So Samson is kind of unique in that. As a matter of fact, after Samson, reading in some of the ancient literature, you see where there's a, a Samson Nazarite vow that comes in. And uh, the Samson Nazarite vow actually allows um, um, a different form of alcohol, not wine, 
but a different form of alcohol, and you can touch dead things. Um, but still, the no cutting of the hair. The no cutting of the hair is is one of the main things that comes out in this story about Samson. So let's let's consider Samson for a minute. So here's Samson. He does some things that that really don't make sense. Um, he was a Nazarite to God from his birth. Now, what I understand about that in my in my research is that those that would give the Nazarite vow to a son or a daughter before birth, at the age of 12 or 13, boy or girl respectively, they could accept that Nazarite vow, continue the rest of their life with it, or they could reject it and, and live a life outside of it. So, so their choice came into play at about that age, but their parents would then con control up until they were that age, and they would live under the, the, the requirements of a Nazarite vow. Now, the Nazarite vow was, was there. It was... It was setting yourself aside for the service of God or to see something done. So you would say, I'm surrendering to this task until. And then you would focus on that task. And that's what the Nazarite vow was kind of focused on, was, was surrendering, uh, setting your life aside. So it, it would be like a long extended period of, of Lent or something like that where you would say, I'm, I'm going to abstain from this, except that it was laid out what you abstained from. And then you serve the Lord you serve the Lord entirely. Um, you can read about Hannah and Samuel and how she set him aside for service to the Lord um, before he was even conceived. And so, you know, there's a picture of these things in Scripture. Now, Samson is no Samuel, that's for sure. But one of the things that we see about Samson is as he began to grow, there's something um, very, very special about Samson, yet at the same time there's something very um, discouraging about Samson. Um, one of the things that we read right off the bat, first of all, his dad just struggled with believing this was true. Doesn't that sound familiar? Um, we think about Zechariah and John the Baptist. Um, and so they, they, they kind of challenge this angel and, and they offer a sacrifice and the angel won't allow it. To... But then as they build this sacrifice and they offer this goat, um, the angel then disappears into the smoke and rises with the smoke all the way to heaven. So it's a phenomenal story. That would be one that would be great, actually, to add on to our study, but we're going to move right on by that. And, and, and look at how, after that, there was the birth of Samson. They, they began... Then the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson. And the child grew up, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir in him at Mahana Dan, or which is the camp of Dan, between Zorah and Eshtal. So, so we, we see that the Spirit of the Lord began to stir in him as a young child. That's a very familiar story because we read over, uh, I believe it's in Luke, that, you know, they, that the Spirit of the Lord was on Jesus when he was young. And it was obvious to people. And you got Jesus going into the temple at 12 and blowing the minds of the teachers. And so, so here you've got not a Jesus type in any way, but you've got God stirring in the life of a young person here. And, and so that's, that's the kind of the history of the Nazarite vow. It's kind of gone away because there is no temple. And so it, if anybody takes a Nazarite vow today, um, followers of Judaism, it's, it's a for life. It can't be because you can't go to the temple to end it. Um, it's, it's for life. And they do allow them to cut their hair some people say once a year, if it gets too heavy. Uh, some people say if it's a Samson Nazarite vow that you can't cut your hair ever. Um, but they, they do, do generally get it in dreads or get it in locks and or get it in braids. And so we, we find out later on that Samson actually had seven, which is interesting because seven is one of those numbers that keeps popping up in Scripture. So, so we got Samson. He's born, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. Now, that's very key to our story today because... Uh, I don't think it had anything to do with his hair. I, had to, had, I think it had to do with his consecration to the Lord and keeping the vow. And we're going to read, uh, if, if you read chapter 14, you'll see right off the bat, Samson wants to marry a Philistine girl because she pleases him well. His father says, can't you find somebody of our own people? Can't you find somebody that, that worships our own God? I mean, you know, basically, after all, you, you, you're a Nazarite. And he says, no, go get her for me because she pleases me well. So he, he goes to marry this Philistine girl. Now, the Bible also goes on and says that his mom and dad, although they were upset, couldn't see that God was actually doing something through this Timonite girl. He was beginning to break down the wall of persecution from the Philistines. He was going to use Samuel to do it. He was going to use his association 
with the Philistines. So God used, that's not that God caused Samson to marry outside of his tribes, but God used it for the, for the bringing about of his own plan. I think that's something interesting because uh, God doesn't tempt us to sin and God doesn't cause us to sin or to do wrong, but he sure will take the wrong that's done to bring about his plan and his will um, for us, but it doesn't mean that we don't suffer along the way. Samson suffered great. And, and, and you can, so, so there's Samson's marriage there to this uh, Tenmanite girl. And um, Samson proposes a riddle to the people that are attending. So he goes down and he throws a party. Oh, by the way, on the way down, he kills a lion that attacks him. And um, through the power of the Lord, he takes this lion and tears it. And takes a lion and he tears it in two. Now, one of the things that I think comes out in the story of Samson is if he looked like big Ronnie Coleman, you know, who won uh, Mr. Olympia eight times, or if he looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger, who also won Mr. Olympia, they wouldn't ask the question, where do you get your strength? Now, think about that. One of the things all through, everybody knows about Samson and Delilah. One of the things all the way through is people say, where do you get your strength? Well, if he was a, a hunk of human, if he was six feet, seven feet, eight feet tall, and covered with muscles, people wouldn't ask that question. They would say, well, he's obviously strong, extremely strong. But I think that he was probably a normal person. I think I don't think there was anything outstanding about Samson whatsoever in his appearance. So there's this constant wondering, where's he get his strength? He doesn't look any different, yet he performs these phenomenal feats. And, and every time he performs some of these really big ones, um, he goes to this wedding feast. Let me get back to the story. He goes to the wedding feast, and he gets a little full of himself. He evidently likes riddles. And so before this happens, you know, he kills the lion. And then the lion carcass is laying there. And then bees uh, make a hive inside the lion carcass. And he comes back by and he sees honey because he's, he's found this Temanite girl and he's gone to visit. And he's on his way back to his father's house. And he finds honey in the carcass of the lion. Now, one of the things that a, a Nazarite cannot do is touch a carcass, touch a dead body. And so what he does, he decides he wants the honey. So he just went ahead and got it. So, so his vows really don't mean a lot to him at this point. He's, he's grown. He's old enough to marry. He knows the Nazarite vows. And so he touches a dead carcass, and he says he didn't tell his dad about it. He just collected the honey, took it to his mom and dad, but he never said where he got it. Well, when he gets back, he tells us tells a riddle. He's in this wedding feast. Now, here's another thing: the word, for, the word, the Hebrew word for feast here that was being thrown for his wedding, the seven day feast, actually means a time of drinking. So another thing that a Nazarite's not supposed to do is to drink. So as far as Nazarite's bow, bow goes. He doesn't really care. The, the only thing we don't see him doing is cutting his hair off. See, the, the hair is the outward picture of the consecration. That's what I want you to gather about the story about Samson. The hair is the outward picture of the inward consecration. Now, we know he broke his vows. We know he dug from a carcass, and we, and we know he was at this drunken party uh, that was going on. And while he was there, you know, probably inebriated, he asked a question, a riddle. Well, a riddle had to do with the dead lion and... And what was in found in the lion, and and you know there were thirty guests that were there, and he said, "Here's what I'm going to do. If you can answer the riddle, I'll give you thirty garments and cloaks to go over them. If you can't answer the riddle, then you're going to each give me a garment. So that would be thirty garments to Samson and the cloaks to go over it. But he didn't tell his wife what the story was, and she said, "Please tell me the story because the people, the Philistines, had come to this girl. So if you don't tell us what he's asking, your 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 family's going to make a fool out of all of us." We're going to burn you and your father and your whole household. So she begins to try to get from Samson what the answer to the riddle was. Well, she betrayed him because he finally, because of all her nagging, he told her the answer to the riddle and, and they answered him the riddle. Well, it made him mad. It made him furious. And so he knew he had to come up with 30 garments. So listen to what was said in verse 19 of chapter 14. It says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of them and took their spoil and gave the changes of clothes to those who told him the riddle. And his anger burned, and he went up into his father's house. But Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his friend. And so, so here's, here's, here's how the story is unfolding. He, he doesn't really care about his vows. He's not really living the part of a dedicated Nazarite. He's married a Philistine outside. God's going to use it, but 
but he's married to Felicity, much to the chagrin of his mom and dad. He's married this young girl. He has gone to this drunken party, and he's asked a riddle. She she lied. She I mean, she tricked him, and she told it out. And then so you know they they said, hey, we got the answer. Last day of the seven days into the party, the last day of the party, the last chance they have, they gave the answer. They, you know what could be sweeter than honey, and what could be stronger than a lion was their answer. Because he was talking about, in his mind, he proposed, proposed a riddle about the lion and the honey in it. Which, you know, caught, you know, he was, you know, obviously philosophizing about that. And he got angry. But it says, look what it says in 19. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. So, so I, again, I want to say that, that Samson probably wasn't anything to look at that would make you think strong. But you're going to see this happens over and over and over again in the life of Samson. Um, he says he would surely take revenge on these people because when he did what he did and killed all those Philistines as, as, at Ashkelon, they then burned his wife. His father had given his wife to his friend. And when this happened, after he killed those people, then they burned her and her family to death. And so... And, and he's fighting, and he goes back, and he's in the area of Judah. And while he's there at Judah, um, 300 soldiers come against him. And what are you doing? You're causing all this trouble. Take it easy, man. Chill out. I mean, you can imagine. And, and nobody wants trouble like that. And Samson's been given the power of God to Don't cause any trouble. Same thing he told Moses. Don't cause any trouble. Couldn't you have just left us alone in, in, in Egypt? Uh, couldn't you just leave us alone? You're causing trouble. And, and they said, you know, we're going to take you down to Philistia. And he says, I'll let you take me as long as you promise not to hurt me. And, and they said, you know, don't, don't kill me. They said they won't kill him. So they bind him up with ropes. Take him down to a little place called Lehi. And it says the Philistines shouted, verse 14 of chapter 15 says the Philistines shouted as they ran to meet him. They were excited because he's their enemy. He'd, he'd already killed 30 of them and, and, and the power of the Lord had come upon him. And it says, as, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. So verse 14 of chapter 15 says the same thing. The spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily so that the ropes that were on his arms were as flax that is burned with fire and his bonds dropped from his hands he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey so that he reached out and took it and he killed a thousand men with it and samson said with the jawbone of a donkey heaps upon heaps with the jawbone of a donkey i have killed a thousand men so so judah carries him down there because they're trying to appease the philistines who have rule over them and and they take him down there he's bound with ropes and they And all these, all these Philistines come running out. There was evidently a thousand or more there anyway. And they come running out. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure the men of Judah then ran because that's kind of what they did back then. And so they were running back and, and there's Samson and a thousand men. And what does Samson do? It says the ropes became his burnt flax and his bonds fell off his hands. You see, it's the spirit of God on him. Um, it's the spirit of God because God's using him. He's consecrated and set aside, although not faithful. And he grabs the jawbone of a dead donkey. Now, again, he's handling a dead animal, which is against his... But he kills a thousand... Can you imagine a thousand people against one man? Now, that's miraculous. Um, when he got finished with that jawbone, and he just threw it down, and he, and he said this little chant, <coughs> a thousand Philistines had died. A thousand. I mean, can you imagine a thousand people in the battle, and nobody could hurt him? The power of God was upon him mightily to defend his people, Israel, from the Philistines that were their taskmasters and lording it over them. And Samson was being used as a judge. Well, we, we go on down and we find out Samson's weakness. One of his, his weaknesses is obviously women because he's brought up in chapter 14. He goes into a prostitute and then he finds this lady named Delilah, the hairdresser, right? So Delilah comes to him, and she's been offered 1,100 pieces of silver from all these different Philistine leaders if she would find out where his strength comes from. So you see, they're now kind of putting it together. There's nothing unique about this guy. 
There's, there's nothing that kind of stands out, yet a thousand Philistines died. So now at least a thousand and thirty have died. Well, before this happens, while he's visiting this prostitute, he's in there with her. They know he's there. It's been reported. And the, the, they're going to gather and catch him about midnight. He gets up and he goes out to the gates of Gaza and he gets the gates. Now, these gates are large and they're, they're on posts and they've got a post that holds them together. They're probably covered in... Um, <clears throat> some form of, sort of cover, he picks up the gates, takes them off their hinges, huge gates, and carries them up on a hill across from Gaza, on a mountain, the Bible says, and throws them down. So, superhuman, every time they think they've got him, he gets away. Every time they, they, he's wrapped in ropes, he gets away because of the power and the strength that God has given him. Now, that instance at Gaza, we're not told that he got superhuman strength it's just we just know that that requires superhuman strength it doesn't say that the spirit of the lord came on him but then he meets delilah and he falls in love with delilah he actually loved her and and she's being offered money to turn on him to to find out what the secret of his strength is and and she she asked him three different times she says tell me what it would take and he says well if you can find seven undried bowstrings and tie me up in those, I can't break them. I become as weak as any other man. Well, she does this, and she's got Philistines in her parlor, and she says, Samson, wake up. The Philistines are upon him. He wakes up, and he just strips those cords off of him. And so that didn't work. He lied. She gets upset. She says, you lied to me. I'm trying to find out how to tie you down, and you keep lying to me. You don't really love me. I don't know why he couldn't see what was going on here. And then he talked about if you tie me up with brand new ropes, ropes that have never been used, then you know then then I'll be you know then you you know you I, I won't I won't be able to fight against that. She tries it. She has the men waiting in the parlor, and she says, "Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you!" And he jumps up and he breaks off those ropes. So he lied again. She's now crying about that again. He says, "Okay, tell you the truth. You take my hair and weave it into a loom and then pin it down inside the loom. I can't move." Um, and so she tries all that. She weaves his, what kind of hair does he have that he, you can weave it into a loom, right? And then she pins it down into the loom and says, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He jumps up, destroys the loom. It's, his strength is all over. He, he tears it all up and he's ready to fight. And the men were gathered in the parlor again. Now, I don't know if he's killing all the men there or if they're just hiding. And then she cries and cries. And I don't know how long this goes on, but Samson was a judge for 20 years. And so in the course of his 20-year tenure, all this is going on with Delilah. And she absolutely wore him out. And, and, and the Bible says something about she's going to be the death of my soul. So he finally breaks down and tells her, my strength is in my hair. Listen to what he says in, in chapter 16, verse 15. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have deceived me these three times and have not told me where your great strength is. And it came about when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him that his soul was annoyed to death. Can you imagine that? So he told her all that was in his heart. And he said to her, A razor has never come on my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaved, then my strength will leave me and I will become weak and be like any other man. Now, here's, here's, my, here's what, I, what I pick up on when I read that. She asked where strength come from. Now, I ask you, where did his strength come from? Did it come from his hair? When he had an opportunity to testify about the Lord possessing him, the Spirit came on him in a mighty way. Several times it says that the Spirit came upon him, the Spirit came upon him. It was God that was doing it. When he had an opportunity to say that, what did he say? My hair is magical. Think about that. He said, my hair is magical. That was the last part of the vow that he hadn't broken. That was what was the picture to the outside world, that he was a man of faith, that he was a man of service. It was the picture that he had taken a Nazarite vow, and he was living up to that. And it was a picture of the anointing of God that was on him, and he told her that it's all in my hair. So what did she do? She has it cut off. And so, so, so my, my problem when I read that is I look at that and I'm like, well, there's the problem. He wasn't giving God the glory. And then listen to what happens. They capture him. Now, remember, this is also all part of God's plan to deliver the Israelites from the Philistines. So they come in 
They capture him. He's weak. He can't do anything. He's weak as any normal man. They come in, the men that are there, they capture him, and they gouge out his eyes immediately. And then they take him to Gaza, and while he's in Gaza, they chain him up with brass chains, and he, he starts to work the mill. He becomes a grain grinder. Now, how long he's there, we don't know how long he's there. But I'll tell you what I think happened while he was there. I think while he was there, he became repentant. I think while he was there, he realized what he had done and, and how he had wasted his life and he had chased after the things this world has to offer instead of the things that he was consecrated to. He was consecrated to be a man of God. Instead, he wanted the things that pleased him well to the point where he even had the anointing removed from him. It says when the men came in and grabbed him, um, she said, wake up, Samson, wake up, for the Philistines are upon you. And he stood up and he says, I'll shake them off as I always do. And what does the Bible say? He did not know the Lord had left him. One of the saddest verses in Scripture. He did not know that the Spirit of God had left him. So by him telling her that secret, and I believe one of the problems with that secret was he didn't acknowledge that God was his power. He acknowledged it was something mystical in his hair or something like that. And so they come in and Dagon is their God and, and they start praising their God that Dagon has given them their enemy. You know, he's killed over a thousand of them and, and they're praising Dagon and praising Dagon and praising Dagon. And you see, Samson's life led to a diminishing of glory to God and, and then a false God, a, a demonic entity of sorts became praised in the place of Yahweh's praise and that's a problem it's always a problem it had nothing and they gouge out his eyes and they put him in this and he begins to grind he, he's a monkey a trained monkey at this point and and so they start to throw this huge party to celebrate now i don't know how long he's in jail Twenty years so however long this was of these 20 years probably um they, they were singing, they were praising. Um, when the people saw him, they, they said, Bring of all the lords and leaders of all of Philistia that have gathered in, and they're worshiping Dagon. And, and so they bring Samson out. But one, thing, one little thing the Bible says, it says, while he was in bonds, his hair began to grow back. And, and, and I want you to understand that that's a picture his hair began to grow back. I believe that what we see in that is that he then accepted his call. He didn't have any haircuts. He never. He then began to live what is part of the Nazarite vow. Now, the Bible doesn't say this specifically, but it does throw in that little line, his hair began to grow back. As his hair is growing back, I believe that he knows who he is. And we're going to see that even though we can't ever see him calling on God, we see God talking to his mom, and we see the angel talking to his dad in, in their doubt, and, and then he was born, and the Spirit of the Lord was on him, but we never really see him give God glory. He seeks his own glory, and he seeks his own own fame, and he's larger than life, and then he's completely humbled when he finally abandons the last part of his anointing being set aside for God, he says, yeah, take my hair off. If you take my hair off, I don't have any power. And so the Spirit of God left him. While he was in bonds, his hair began to grow back. And I think we're, we're seeing a picture of he was then accepting the challenge of being consecrated to God. And he became that person that he should have been all along. He accepted his call. He had a calling on his life from birth, yet he chose not to walk in it. And you, you see, that's a problem. You see, that's an issue to choose not to walk in your calling. And so it's interesting. Uh, they, they bring him out and they're, they're chanting, Our God has given our enemy into our hands, even the destroyer of our country who has slain many of us. And so happened that when they were in high spirits, so they're all drinking, they're all high, they're all partying, they said, Call for Samson that he may amuse us. So they bring him out and he's amusing them. And he's blind now, so he's being led by this young child. His hair's beginning to grow back. And again, I don't think there was anything physically strong looking about Samson. And he's been working in a mill, working this grinder. I think he's probably uh, probably haggard looking and, and his hair's beginning to grow back however long. I, I, some pastor I read said he was in there seven years. I don't know. 
I, I do not know. But his hair began to grow back, and, and I believe that that is a picture of his consecration to the Lord. And so they bring him out, and there are 3,000 men and women who are on the roof looking while Samson was amusing them. Then verse 28 of chapter 16, the Bible says, Then Samson called to the Lord Yahweh and said, O Lord God. Think about that. O, is, is he back where he needs to be? Now we have this man who's lived for himself. We have this man who's been humbled mightily. We have this man who could have been more powerful than even than he was. And, and, and yet God is using him to begin the demise of the Philistines. Now he's humbled to the point. He's letting his hair grow back out. He's accepting his call. He's accepting his anointing. He says, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time. I don't think he felt strength. I don't think he realized that there was any strength back in him. His hair had grown back out, but that doesn't mean there's any strength in him. I think that we see that he has begun that consecration point, and he doesn't feel strong. And so he prays, because what, when, did, when was he strong? When the Spirit of the Lord came on him mightily. The Spirit of the Lord came on him mightily. The Spirit of the Lord came on him mightily. And so we see that's the picture. Where did Samson get his strength? From the Spirit of the Lord. He realizes that, and, and he says, Please remember me and please strengthen me just this time, O God, that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle, middle pillars on which the house rested <clears throat> and braced himself against them. And with the one in his right hand and the other with his left, and Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines and be, be bent with all his might. So that the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those he killed in his life. There's, there's a story of Samson right there. So you see, there at the end, he prayed, Lord, let my strength be there. Let, would you strengthen me just this time? I don't think he's been living in the strength of God at that point. I think that his heart has become right. And I think he's back in right focus and uh, there's maybe a problem with him wanting to avenge his two eyes and kill all those 3,000 people. And I know that a lot of people are upset about that, that God let him kill 3,000 Philistines. But you've got to remember these Philistines had an opportunity to follow God and be a part of his people, but they chose not to. And they were persecuting his people of whom the Messiah was going to come. So Philist the Philistine kingdom began to crumble with the death of Samson, which we're told back at the very beginning, chapter 14, this was part of God's plan. He got among them. They got to know him. He was tainted. He um, when he gave up the true anointing. And then we see strength yet. He prayed for it. God blessed him with strength. And he was able to destroy 3,000 plus Philistines who had been persecuting all of the Israelites, and God righted his people in the land again. I think it's a fabulous story. I think it's a wonderful story about Samson. He's listed in Hebrews chapter 11, the, the chapter of faith, as one of the ones the writer says, I couldn't even go into all the other heroes of the faith like Samson and David and, and all these other people. So Samson's listed in the, as a hero of faith. And that's something else that kind of makes you go, really? It's amazing. Because what he did when he called upon God at the end of his life, you know where Samson is. He is a child of God, and he was brought to that realization. So I pray today that as you hear this story and that you think about um, the things that have happened in Scripture, the things that we see listed there, that you understand that the consecration and separation unto God is a very important thing. We shouldn't take it lightly. I, I don't take my calling lightly. I've been called to minister. I've been called to pastor. Um, yes, there have been times in my life when I said, Lord, let me do anything else but your will be done. And I'm still in the ministry, still pastoring today because it's just, it's just difficult at times. But you know what? It's absolutely 100% worth it. The difficulties are worth it. And, and just like Samson, I have had times where I wanted to do things my way. And I just thank God that he has preserved me to this moment in this house, in this place, in this town and in this time. I thank God that I'm allowed to live in this time, and I pray that he use me mightily 
And I hope that this is your prayer too. Let me have a word of prayer and we'll close this evening. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for Samson. I thank you for the teaching. I thank you for all that, that's revealed in that, Lord. I, I pray that you would help us to grow, that you would help us to see the truth that's in these stories and help us to grow in our faith as we see those who were your children who failed yet were restored because they returned to faith in you. And I pray you'll guide us and direct us. Bless us now as we go into the last of the week. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. God bless you. I'm Pastor Rusty. I'll talk to you later.